Welcome to Human Monsters. Before I start, I wish to note that the criminal profiled in this episode is Australian, and I poke fun at a couple aspects of Australian culture. I want all Aussie listeners to know that I mean no disrespect. I offer nothing but love to you all. Australia is practically a sibling nation in relation to Canada in a historical context. I've never met an Australian I didn't like, and I would love to visit someday so I can go camping and risk my life walking among a third of the planet's most dangerous species. I love ACDC, Midnight Oil, and I love The Castle, an independent Australian film I would recommend to anybody of any nationality. And Crocodile Dundee as well, of course. Oh, and if you have Netflix, I highly recommend the female prison drama series, Wentworth. You'll love it. It's also come to my attention that Foster's is not Australian for beer. Supposedly, it's worse than British piss. Pass the pickled eggs, please. Do they have pickled eggs in Australian pubs? All right, everybody, enjoy the show. Eric Edgar Cook was born on February 25, 1931, in Perth, Western Australia. His beginnings were hardly auspicious. For those who wonder where serial killers acquire their unresolved anger, one indicator for Eric Edgar Cook was his congenital deformities. He had a cleft lip and palate. He was bullied relentlessly and without mercy, subject to both verbal and physical abuse on and off the playground. He underwent corrective surgery starting at the age of three months. These procedures yielded mixed results, and not only were the scars insulting to his general appearance, but they led to a speech impediment that propped him up as a target for ridicule. He was also humiliated by relatives for this condition. The impact of this abuse by the empathy impaired took a toll on his mental health. He developed social anxiety and dysregulation of mood. Being targeted for abuse because of his disabilities wasn't the worst of what he endured in his dysfunctional family's home. His parents, Father Vivian and Mother Christine, married in haste when she became pregnant with Eric. They had two more children, but they didn't suffer as much abuse at the hands of their father as did Eric. Whether Vivian had a chip on his shoulder for having a name that has never enjoyed unisex status remains unknown. Mock his name, and he either would have swung his purse at you, or he would have gotten a fist planted firmly in your face. It would probably have been the latter. Besides, if he had carried a shoulder bag, it would likely have been used to conceal his brass knuckles. Let that be a potential cautionary tale to all expecting parents. Whether or not he owned a shoulder bag and brass knuckles, what has been verified as truth is that he was a violent alcoholic. He beat and psychologically terrorized both Christine and Eric. Vivian was bitter about being forced into marriage. Ultimately, he decided that the consequences of the parental and societal pressures that ruined his life would be best rerouted to his wife and son. Eric was often the sole target, but sometimes Eric would intervene when Vivian beat his mother, and he would take the hit for her. Vivian truly hated Eric. The way he saw it, Eric was not just deformed, but also useless to anybody. For most people, Eric's mumbling was a minor and short-lived inconvenience since they struggled to understand him. Vivian hated his son with a vengeance and found his very presence unbearable. The violence became more and more frequent to the point that sometimes Christine would spend the night at the hotel where she worked. Not only was she tired of being a punching bag, but she knew that Eric would likely intervene, and she didn't want him to get hurt either. There is no way to cope with a punch in your face unless you fight back, but only being a boy, Eric didn't stand a chance. The only way out was out. He would leave the house for long periods and either roam throughout the neighborhood or hide underneath the house. It was the only way to protect himself from the man whose charge in his life was to protect him from violence. When that kind of hypocrisy is baked into the abuse, it can forever distort one's sense of right and wrong. It wasn't just Christine who failed to protect Eric. Police and Eric's teachers were aware that he was being abused, but did nothing. 
During Eric's childhood, such professionals had not been appointed as mandated reporters. Only after the Family Law Act of 1975 was passed into law was an onus placed on teachers and police officers to report indicators of child abuse and neglect to the authorities. There was nothing for Eric to do but suffer. Eric's academic prowess demonstrated two specialties, rote memorization and any activity that involved working with his hands. At the time, it was widely assumed throughout the general population that people with cleft lips were mentally deficient, but Eric Cook was deceptively bright. His deformity may not have affected his academic performance, but the stigma he faced was a social liability for years. It was everybody else who needed to be educated when it came to that issue, but few would have been inclined to do their homework on the subject. Eric couldn't outperform his bullies intellectually or physically, but there were alternative methods to demonstrating one's competence. At the age of six, he was caught stealing money from a teacher's purse. He was expelled for this stunt, and it was the seminal event that begat his downward spiral into criminality. Eric was enrolled in five primary schools following this incident, and he was withdrawn from all five due to transgressive and recalcitrant behavior. He was bullied at every school, daily. At the age of 14, it became clear to everybody with knowledge of Eric's behavioral track record that his future did not portend a distinguished record of scholastic achievement. He was withdrawn from school and was dispatched to the job market to help support the family. They needed the money since Christine got paid very low wages, and Vivian's drinking negated his ability to hold down a job. By the time he turned 18, Eric had run afoul of the law on a few occasions, and for the first time in his life, somebody showed him some compassion with the intention of rehabilitating him. He met Reverend George Jenkins of the local Methodist church. Jenkins counseled Eric and helped him sort out the emotional fallout from the abuse and bullying he suffered as a boy. The church offered a chance to experience some social acceptance, and he was baptized into the faith. Eventually, Eric frequented Nedlands Methodist Church. He did not enjoy as much camaraderie among this parish. Most of the congregation dwelled in the more affluent suburbs of Perth. He began to steal from them. Once this came to light, he was deemed incapable of redemption. Eric leaned into crime as his vocation of choice. This happened when he was about 17 years old. He frequently took to lurking the streets at night. When he wasn't committing acts of petty crime, he was a serial peeping Tom. These acts were more motivated by mischief than malice, though there was also an element of financial privation behind it all. He would sell what he could steal and bring the money home to his mother. He became what was known as a snowdropper. This dubious honorific was bestowed upon men who stole women's undergarments from clotheslines. When he was arrested, a pair of panties was found in his pocket. Ultimately, he was perceived by police as more of a nuisance than a threat to public safety. Eventually, Eric Cook advanced from petty theft to burglaries. Escalation was underway, and one day he burned down a church after they rejected him from joining the choir. He was sentenced to 18 months for arson. It wasn't the first incident of property damage. Whenever somebody did wrong to him, he would break into their home and damage their belongings. After tearing apart their furniture and clothing, he would steal any valuables he could find, including money, jewelry, and even food. On one occasion, he was so spiteful, he boiled the occupant's goldfish. He took pride in these offenses. Whenever one of them was reported in the local newspaper, he would cut out the article and show it to people he knew in hopes of winning their respect and friendship. In 1953, a fingerprint matching his proved he was the main suspect in a burglary. This time he received a lenient sentence, a fine, and a good behavior bond. He was caught stealing a car in 1955. He wasn't quite so lucky when it came time for sentencing. 
he was sent to prison for a relatively long period of time. Oddly, he would always return a car to its owner after stealing it. You could say he was borrowing it without permission. More likely, only he would say that. Despite routinely breaking the law, local police did not dislike Eric Cook. They were aware of his traumatic childhood, complete with the abuse and bullying, and it hardly came as a surprise that someone who was dealt such a miserable hand would feel at odds with society. Cook was also remembered for being a model prisoner who was polite, compliant, and never in denial about his guilt. He even acquired a nickname from the police, that being Cookie. It's certainly better to acquire that moniker from a cop than a physically superior cellmate. He hadn't committed any violent crimes, so they considered him a likable rogue who had lost his way. Eric's forays into legitimate employment manifested first as a delivery boy for central provision stores. After working several other menial jobs, he eventually was hired as a truck driver, though his career in transportation was cut short due to one of his arrests. Eric enlisted in the permanent military forces. He excelled as a marksman. His talent for marksmanship boosted his self-esteem. Not only did it buttress his sense of importance, but he liked how it made him feel dominant. Unfortunately, his career in the military was cut short after three months when his criminal record came to light. When he was 21, he went to Melbourne and re-enlisted in the service. There was little communication between bases, so they knew nothing about his criminal history until a background check three and a half months later. He was discharged, but his ability and acumen in the area of marksmanship was consolidated. He was too ashamed of being discharged, so he would lie about it, telling people he fought in the Korean War and was injured. He claimed the injury necessitated the installation of a steel plate in his head. 1953. Eric met 18-year-old Sarah Lathan at the West Perth Metropolitan Markets. He was driving truck and she was waiting tables. She was born and raised in England and moved to Australia to flee an economy in crisis. Eric turned on the charm and before long, they fell in love. They married in October of that year. By that time, Sarah was pregnant with the first of their seven children. The honeymoon was short-lived. Though Sarah was aware of Eric's criminal past, she assumed that it was behind him and that he would commit to being a husband and father and set an example for his children by taking up legitimate employment. This was not to be. In 1955, he stole a car, an offense for which he was arrested and charged. He was initially sentenced to a two-year prison term, though he was released in December 1956. Abuse and domestic violence are often cyclical, affecting multiple generations. As much as he despised his father, he would ultimately end up emulating his example. Eric abused both his wife and children, verbally and physically. When he wasn't making their lives miserable with abuse, he would disappear, sometimes for days at a time. There was no warning or explanation. If Sarah asked him where he'd been, he would tell her to mind her business. Eric's son, Tony, remembered his childhood home as being a place where he was constantly living in fear. His father would lash out with violence with very little provocation. His mood swings were unpredictable. The atmosphere was infused with chaos, and Tony's safety was never assured. His father could be extremely spiteful and cruel, and Tony came to look upon him as a monster. His brother, Michael, who was disabled, would get beaten for no apparent reason. Tony also recalled being attacked by his father unprovoked. There were pleasant moments, but they were few and far between. His daughter Jennifer recalled being treated well by Eric to the point of doting on her and giving her special gifts. He even played princess with her. Michael was mentally disabled and was persecuted by Eric as he had been by Vivian for what he considered to be unforgivable flaws.
Sarah would eventually learn that Eric was committing burglaries at night. Otherwise, he would be out womanizing, using money he had stolen. Sarah had no other means of support, and she didn't want to leave her children, so she stayed with him. 1958. Next Level Eric Edgar Cook advanced from thief, arsonist, and vandal to a vicious and heartless, violent criminal. 1959. Final Level. Murder. January 30th, 1959. Eric Cook broke into the home of 33-year-old Panina Berkman. As she slept, he took up a knife in the kitchen and went to her bedroom, where he stabbed her unto her death. December 20th, 1959. Eric Cook broke into the house of Jillian Brewer while she was asleep. He stabbed her to death with a pair of scissors. He mutilated her body after she was dead. Feeling parched, he took a bottle of lemonade from her refrigerator and went outside to drink it. Having finished his beverage, he returned to Jillian's body. Another man was blamed for the crime and spent several years trying to clear his name. January 26, 1963. Eric Edgar Cook victimized three people that evening. The first victim was 29-year-old Brian Weir. January is summer in Australia, and Brian was sleeping facing his veranda door, which was open. Eric saw him from outside the house. He took aim with his gun and shot him in the head. Brian survived, though he died three years later. 55-year-old George Walmsley heard somebody summoning him to the front door. When he opened the door, he didn't see anybody. A bullet emerged from the shadows, special delivery from Eric Edgar Cook's rifle. He shot George in the center of his forehead. George died minutes after his wife and daughter found him. 19-year-old John Sturkey slept on the veranda of the boarding house he was living in to escape the encapsulated heat in the house. Eric killed him with one headshot. John's roommate woke when he heard John moaning, and he contacted first responders. But John perished before daybreak. 17-year-old Rosemary Anderson was walking along a road when she was killed. Eric ran her over in a stolen car. She was injured in her head and abdomen with supplemental injuries such as abrasions and lacerations. Her boyfriend took her to hospital when he found her. She died during surgery. Her boyfriend was initially blamed for the murder, and he was plagued by the allegations for years. February 15, 1963. 24-year-old Lucy Madrill was asleep when Eric Edgar Cook broke into her house. He accidentally knocked over a framed photograph, which woke her up. When she saw him standing there, she leapt up and they struggled. Putting an end to that, he strangled her until she fell unconscious. He detached the cord from the lamp by her bed and strangled her with it until she perished. Once he was sure she was dead, he raped her body. Once he was finished defiling her corpse, he dragged her outside and left her on her neighbor's lawn. Somebody left an empty whiskey bottle on the lawn. Eric penetrated Lucy's vagina with the bottle. Satisfied, he placed the bottle in her arms and left her in this pose when he departed. August 10, 1963. 18-year-old Shirley McLeod was babysitting for the Dowd family at their house. At some point in the evening, she fell asleep on a couch with her school books in her arms following a period of study. She was unaware that a home invasion was underway. Eric Edgar Cook crept up during her slumber and shot her in her forehead. She died instantly. When the Dowd parents returned, they initially thought she was sleeping. She was still clutching her school books. There were other violent crimes committed by Cook at this time, for which he was charged, 14 to be exact. Some of them eventually incurred attempted murder charges. Some consisted of assaulting the victim in their home at night, and others were vehicular assaults. 
September 12, 1958. 26-year-old Dutch immigrant Nell Schneider was a mother of two children. She was riding a bicycle toward her home in the suburban district of Bentley when Eric Cook ran her down with a stolen car. She suffered a head injury but survived. November 25, 1958. Details about this crime are limited. Molly McLeod was assaulted in her sleep. December 27, 1958. Kathy Bellis was the latest hit and run victim of Eric Edgar Cook. She survived. August 8, 1959. Alex Donkin was viciously assaulted in her sleep. She survived. April 9, 1960. 19-year-old Glennis Peake was walking home after a dance. She was hit by a car driven by Eric Cook. She survived. May 13, 1960. Jill Connell was killed by Eric Cook by way of hit and run. May 20, 1960. Maureen Rogers, Georgina Pittman, and Therese Zagami were riding Vespa scooters as a trio. Eric Edgar Cook ran them all down. They survived. March 3, 1962. Ann Melvin, later known as Ann Whitsed, was attacked by Eric Cook in her home. She woke mid-strangle. She tried to fight back, but to no avail. Once he regained control, he raped her. Breaking the mold, he left the house instead of killing her. December 29, 1962. 25-year-old Peggy Flurry was attacked in her bed by Eric Edgar Cook. He raped her and punched her in the eye. She screamed, which woke her parents, who ran to her aid. Cook managed to flee the house before they could intervene. Nicholas August and Rowena Reeves were sitting in his car having a few drinks. It was Australia Day, and they were celebrating the occasion. At one point, Nicholas noticed a man lurking in the shadows. He was watching them. Nicholas threw a bottle at him and told him to go away. Eric Edgar Cook's rebuttal? A bullet. Straight from his rifle into Nicholas's flesh. Nicholas survived the shot. Cook shot Rowena in her wrist. She survived. They took off in the car before Cook could land another shot. June 15, 1963. Carmel Reed was asleep when she woke and was shocked to see a strange man in her room. He was holding her umbrella. He stabbed her with it. The wound was superficial. He punched her for good measure. As they struggled, her neighbor woke, and when he inquired about the commotion, Eric left. The police still didn't have a clue that Eric Edgar Cook was responsible for these crimes. He invested a great deal of forethought while planning his crimes. His weapons and vehicles were stolen, so none of those items could be traced back to him. He even wore gloves to avoid leaving fingerprints, and they were women's gloves. At some point, Eric Edgar Cook must have gotten cocky. It was a very unbecoming mistake he made that he would normally have avoided at all costs. When he murdered Shirley MacLeod in August 1963, he ditched the rifle with which he shot her, throwing it in some bushes on Rookwood Avenue in Mount Pleasant. It wasn't like him to be so cavalier with such a crucial item of evidence. One day an elderly couple were taking a walk when they spotted the rifle and reported it to police. The police submitted the rifle for ballistics testing and fingerprinting. The results of the tests revealed that it was the rifle that was used to murder Shirley MacLeod. They were one step closer to discovering the identity of the perpetrator. There were no fingerprints, but they devised a plan to find the owner of the rifle. They would use the gun as bait. Well, not that exact model. It remained in evidence. The police obtained a similar rifle and put it where the original was found. They attached a length of fishing line from the hiding place of their choosing to the rifle. That way, if anybody moved it, they would know immediately. 
It wasn't a fail-safe plan. There was no guarantee the killer would retrieve the gun. They were willing to take the risk nonetheless. For the subsequent 17 days, the police squatted near the hiding place. Just after midnight on September 1st, a car pulled up. Traffic in that suburb at that time of night was rare to non-existent, so the presence of this motorist was significant. A man got out of the car and walked toward the general vicinity of the rifle's hiding place. Detectives Peter Scan and Bill Hawker sat and awaited his next move. When the man found the rifle, he picked it up. Scan and Hawker jumped out from the bushes and grabbed Eric Edgar Cook. He had no inkling that police officers had been waiting for him, and he was in such shock that he hadn't had time to flee when they detained him. They wrestled him to the ground. They discovered that Cook was wearing a pair of women's gloves and had a pair of panties in his pocket. Cook claimed that he had seen the rifle before when he pulled over to that part of the road to relieve himself and had intended to keep it. The detectives didn't buy it. He was placed under arrest. Eric Cook was taken to the police station to be interrogated. Detectives were dispatched to his home to inform his wife that her husband was detained. They noted to others that Cook was unflappable, as if committing murder, in his view, was merely a breach of etiquette. It only occurred to him during questioning that the death penalty was in the realm of possibility. Though they were sure of his culpability in the murder of Shirley MacLeod, little did they know that her murder was the tip of the iceberg when it came time to calculate his final body count. It's no wonder. He was an organized and methodical executioner whose profile was swaddled in a cloak of anonymity. In the meantime, the names of two victims were publicized, Rowena Reeves and Nicholas August. The police did not seek their consent before bringing their names to the attention of the general population. It was deeply upsetting for them because it meant the killer could look them up and seek retribution before he was caught. Fortunately, it never transpired. Throughout questioning, Eric confessed to the murder of Shirley MacLeod. The detectives suspected he was guilty of some murders that occurred on Australia Day. There was no evidence, however, so they took the tack of bringing in officers who had been friendly with Cook. Detectives Nielsen and Mormon were brought in for this task. They treated it almost like a date, taking Eric out to lunch at a hotel. However much comfort Cook may have felt, it was short-lived. Detective Baker, as a member of this dining party, informed Cook that he was going to hang for the murder of Shirley MacLeod. He also reminded him of how it would impact his wife and children. Unexpectedly, Eric began to cry. These were not crocodile tears. His vocalizations were described as wailing. He reached across and took a pen from Baker's pocket. He had always done this when confessing to crimes, usually his burglaries and petty offenses. Baker knew the proverbial house of cards had fallen. However, Baker hadn't anticipated that Eric's history with violent behavior would become notable for being so pervasive and prolific. Only now were the tides of the ocean of blood at a low ebb, and the cold, unflinching eye of justice would get a crystal clear visage of all the stragglers that were left behind after having been submerged beyond the view of law enforcement. There's an ongoing debate about how many victims one must accumulate before they earn their serial killer merit badge. Some say that two is not enough. There was no such debate when it came to Eric Edgar Cook's kill count. He confessed to a total of eight murders. He also confessed to 14 attempted murders and 250 burglaries. He astounded the detectives with his recall of the events. He would remember minutiae, like a frying pan that was left on a stove. November 25, 1963. Eric Edgar Cook appeared before the presence of Justice Virtue at the Supreme Court of Western Australia. He had already confessed to his crimes, so there was no way his attorney could prove his innocence. All he could do was plead not guilty by reason of insanity. His lawyer, K.W. Hatfield, insisted that he was a, quote, living abnormality. You can't argue with airtight logic like that. 
He said Cook suffered from a psychotic disorder, like schizophrenia, and was therefore unable to distinguish between right and wrong. He noted that the abuse he endured as a child at the hands of his father was likely a contributing factor, since brain damage had likely been inflicted on him. Eric had indeed been hospitalized as a child for injuries to his head, but he was not diagnosed with a neurological disorder. Cook was evaluated for symptoms of a mental illness at his lawyer's request. The doctor found no signs of schizophrenia or any related disorder. Hatfield requested a second opinion, but it was not granted. The trial was only three days long. Cook was found guilty of murder and was sentenced to death by hanging. He was eligible to file an appeal, but he declined the opportunity to do so. He even told his lawyers not to bother. Eric knew he was guilty and felt he deserved the sentence he received. He thanked the judge and accepted his punishment without incident. During the trial, he confessed to two murders that had not only gone unsolved, but that had resulted in two men being wrongfully accused. He was remanded to Fremantle Prison, where he would face his execution within a year. Eric Edgar Cook's hanging would make a lasting impact on Australia's judicial system. The government was approaching the death penalty with sober second thought. Eric Edgar Cook was the last Australian criminal to be hung. Three hundred and thirty-three days elapsed before the execution of Eric Edgar Cook. Consistent with his history as an inmate, he was respectful and obedient with corrections officers and polite to his fellow convicts. He didn't break any rules and he never got into fights. He would tell anybody who listened about his wife and children. He was frustrated that nobody believed him when it came to the innocence of the men who were wrongfully convicted for his crimes. So frustrated was he that he went on a hunger strike as protest. Cook's wife, Sarah, visited him in prison. She felt it was her wifely duty. She wanted to ask him why he committed the murders and assaults, but could not summon the nerve to do so. Having built up enough fortitude to inquire, he told her that when he killed, he could feel the power of God. October 26, 1964. Eric Edgar Cook was awoken before dawn and taken to a room known as the Death Cell. It was there where he awaited his execution. Inmates are remanded there on the day in question so that the staff can avoid provoking tensions among the general population. Guards he had been friendly with escorted him to the death cell, since their presence was expected to keep him calm. He showered and dressed in the clothes he was to die in. There were no buttons on the outfit. It was held together with ties. Sarah had visited the previous day to say goodbye. She did not witness the execution. Neither did the relatives of the deceased. The only witnesses were prison staff and his old religious mentor, Reverend George Jenkins. He performed last rites and took Eric's confession. He confessed to killing Jillian Brewer and Rosemary Anderson. He was still concerned about the men who were accused of the crimes because the Court of Appeals initially assumed Cook was deceptive on the matter. 8 a.m. Dead man walking. A cloth hood was placed over Cook's head. This procedure was a preventative measure. The rope would not burn his neck. Witnesses would not see his face with an anguished expression. Seeing him with his tongue protruding from his mouth would have been disturbing for onlookers. In Australia, a white cotton cloth was customary for this purpose. Eric was brought in for a rope fitting, as if tailoring a brand new suit. Prison staff took Eric's measurements to ensure the rope would be adjusted to the appropriate length and width. A few people have survived hanging and have noted that it was an extremely painful experience. Eric was asked if he had any final words to say. He did, but they are unknown. However recent it had been, he had said, Crikey! for the last time. He went on to become the 154th person in the history of Western Australia to be executed by hanging. No more Vegemite for him. His suffering was at an end. Naturally, it would never cease for the survivors and families of the deceased. 
Forty years later, it was only at this point in history when Eric Edgar Cook's assertions about the guilt of the men who were framed for the murders of Gillian Brewer and Rosemary Anderson were taken seriously. One of the suspects was named John Button. He was an English immigrant and had been Rosemary Anderson's boyfriend. They got into an argument on his birthday, and she left the house, refusing to let him drive her home. After he stopped for a cigarette break, he drove on, with the intention of calming her and persuading her to get into his car. When he tracked her down, she was lying on the side of the road and was gravely injured, and though unconscious, she was still alive. After bringing her injuries to the attention of first responders, after which she died in hospital, he was brought to Central Police Station to be questioned. John had a stutter, and this convinced the police that he was hiding something, and therefore guilty. In violation of his rights as a citizen of Australia, he was not allowed to contact a lawyer or his parents. One of the officers even assaulted him. He was interrogated for 22 straight hours, with no breaks, until they prevailed over him, and he confessed to the murder of which he was innocent. At the outset, he was charged with willful murder, whose penalty was usually death, but the charge was eventually downgraded to manslaughter. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Ironically, he did some of his time at Fremantle Prison, while Eric Cook awaited his execution, though they were housed in different units and never crossed paths. Surely this circumstance left a foul taste in Anderson's mouth, even worse than Vegemite. Anderson filed multiple appeals, but they were all shot down. Even Eric Cook's confession to the crime didn't result in Anderson's release. In 1998, a book entitled Broken Lives was published. It was a thorough investigation of the case that examined the roles played by Cook, Anderson, and a man named Daryl Beamish. Due to the facts that were exposed by the publication of the book, John Button's case took another run through the courts. One crucial article of evidence was damage that was present on Anderson's car at the time of Rosemary's death. Though it was assumed that it was a result of running her over, Button insisted that he had an accident three weeks before the murder. The police and prosecuting attorney had been aware of this detail, but dismissed it before the advent of the trial, feeling it was too minute as a detail to be introduced in court. Another important finding was that a doctor who treated Rosemary at the hospital reported that her injuries were not typical of the kind that would be inflicted by the particular make and model of Button's car. John Button's conviction was overturned on February 25, 2002 by the Court of Criminal Appeals. It was due to the evidence relating to the make of Button's car. John Button would go on to run the Western Australian Innocence Project which involves itself with freeing people who have been wrongfully convicted. In 2003, John Button received a payout of $460,000 as compensation for his own wrongful conviction and 10 years of incarceration. Daryl Beamish was 18 years old at the time of Gillian Brewer's murder. He was deaf and mute. He had a criminal record. He had sexually abused a child and had committed a petty crime. The police assumed that his pedophilia rendered him a suitable candidate for the perpetrator of the crime. Allegedly, he confessed four times. Two confessions were submitted through a sign language interpreter. Another was a formal written statement, and he wrote the fourth on the walls of the exercise yard in prison. He was convicted for the murder in 1961 due to the confessions, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. Later, the sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. He served 15 years. This case formed the premise of a book called The Beamish Case, written by Professor of Jurisprudence Peter Brett in 1966. He considered the trial and conviction to be a significant miscarriage of justice. When Eric Cook confessed to the murder of Gillian Brewer, it was not enough to bolster Beamish's case. The appeal court still considered Eric Cook to be a liar. Maybe Daryl Beamish should have said, Why would I kill that woman? I'm a pedophile. I only hurt children. Beamish's conviction was finally overturned in April 2005. The Court of Criminal Appeals in Western Australia recognized that Eric Cook had more credibility than they had previously thought, thanks to the success of John Button's final appeal. 
Fifty years after his conviction, Daryl Beamish was given $425,000. Many people felt the sum was insufficient. They must have forgotten that he was also a convicted child molester. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now, and good day.